Well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, this webinar is, is called The uh, New Era of Traceability from Compliance to Profits for Meat Processors. Um, it's actually part two of our Traceability for Dummies uh, webinar series. Um, last month, we had our first webinar, and that took a more uh, generic theme to it, where in part two, we're uh, focusing entirely on what traceability is in the meat industry. Um, so today's speakers, I'm really happy to have with me today, are uh, um, Daphne Nice-Hall, who is the Technical Director from the Ontario Independent Meat Processors, um, Gavin McGee, who is uh, our Customer Implementation Specialist here at Carlisle Technology. Um, I'd like to note if you've actually ever purchased a system from Carlisle over the past few years, you may, Gavin's face may be familiar to you. And uh, lastly, uh, myself is Wayne Slater, and uh, I am the Director of Sales and Marketing here at uh, Carlisle, and uh, oh, I happen to write a little book called Food Traceability for Dummies, maybe some of you have seen before too. So let's move on into the webinar, shall we? So today's agenda is very, very simple. Um, we're going to focus specifically on meat, and we're going to explore some of the key challenges associated with traceability, specifically in the meat industry, and then get right into some of the key elements of an automated traceability system, and then apply those elements to a specific uh, beef processor use case. And after we've uh, shipped some product, we'll get into doing a, a recall, leveraging Carlisle Symphony's plant uh, floor production and traceability software. Um, then we'll dig into some of the associated benefits and then wrap up with an open QA session, um, which will obviously interact with you there. Um, oh, and at the end of this, uh, this webinar, too, we'll provide you a link to uh, download the, uh, the, the free uh, Traceability for Dummies book as well. Oh, and if you have any questions at all during this webinar, we will um, hold a Q&A at the end. But feel free, if, if something strikes you during the webinar, to, uh, to type your questions into the chat window. It's actually on the right-hand side in your console there. And we'll start queuing up the questions that we'll deal with in the Q&A session at the end. So let's uh, jump right in. Um, so today's uh, meat uh, packing and processing industry is really quite a different beast than it was just you know, 30 to 40 years ago. Um, in many ways, it's actually amazing to think that uh, with the ever-increasing population growth and globalization enabling meat processors to sell to a growing number of markets today, that there are actually fewer meat plants today. Um, the meat industry has become kind of a low-margin, high-volume game for the most part. Uh, most companies are turning to value-added further processing to differentiate their products and increase their profits. But today in North America, we are living in the era of the mega plant. Um, Today's plants are typically high output producers, um, more efficient in their production as they need to be to remain competitive, and employ technology where they can to streamline processes and reduce business risk. Um, but one of the most significant business risks to any meat uh, processing company today would be a large scale recall. Um, they can be really expensive in this new era of high volume production. So if you're on the, the, the prior webinar we did a month ago, uh, we kind of briefly uh, went over these, but these are, these are great reminders to, uh, to talk about. So, so some of the, uh, the more notable on costly recalls over the last uh, few years, I uh, want to talk about is West, uh, Westland Hallmark Meat Packing Company. Um, they were the subject of the largest meat recall in the United States. Um, the recall came in the wake of an, an animal cruelty and violations law infringement at, a Calif at their California slaughtering plant. Um, yeah, at the request of the FDA, um, you know, they were asked to recall more than 143 million pounds of beef. Uh, the initial cost of the recall were to, back to the company, exceeded $116 million. And then in uh, November 2012, uh, they also received the $500 million, uh, well, they had to come up with a $500 million settlement with uh, the numerous plaintiffs that litigated against them, including the federal government. Um, However, that assessment would go unpaid as the, as the company filed for bankruptcy. And then one we've probably all heard of up here north of the border was XL Foods. Uh, they're a Canadian-based uh, meat packing company located in Alberta. Uh, the company sold beef throughout the United States and Canada um, at volumes of about 2,000 to 5,000 cattle per day. Um, XL um, handled approximately one-third of all Canadian beef production. Um, in 2012, uh, they were temporarily closed due uh, to an E. coli outbreak. Um, American and uh, Canadian regulatory uh, bodies determined that their testing procedures that were in place at the, at the plant were inadequate to protect customers. Um, the E. coli contamination at XL Foods resulted in 18 confirmed cases of infection, 
as well as uh, the recall of food products in both companies or countries. Sorry, um, the U.S. blocked beef imports from the plant, and 2,200 workers at the plant were sent home. Um, the Canadian Cattlemen's Association estimates the uh, largest recall in Canadian history had an economic impact that cost the industry about $27 million. Um, more recently, though, Excel has reopened uh, under the watchful eye of a new owner. Uh, they're a Brazilian-based uh, packing giant uh, that has much tighter risk management culture. And then even pet food is not immune from uh, costly recalls. Now, uh, back in 2007, uh, Canadian-based menu foods, uh, once the largest producer of pet foods in North America, was held liable for the distribution of a product tainted with a lethal cocktail of reactive chemicals. Um, the incident has been labeled one of the largest consumer product recalls in North American history. Uh, the recall involved over 60 million units of pet food at a cost of about $42 million. Um, an additional $24 million was paid out in litigation. And, of course, it had an impact on the company as well. So after share prices plummeted, the company was bought out. Um, so it gives you an idea, again, how costly these recalls can be. Um, and speaking about some more of the challenges in the industry, I'd like to introduce uh, Daphne from the Ontario Independent Meat Processors now to talk a bit more about that. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Wayne, for inviting me to speak to you today about traceability and, and to your invitees. Traceability is an important and timely subject for the food processing industry. With both the U.S. and Canadian governments introducing their inspection and modernization initiatives, which will include mandatory traceability for food products, the globalization of the food supply, and in recent years, greater focus on food safety incidents, as Wayne just described, the requirement for robust traceability systems has never been more apparent. This presentation will highlight some of the pressures and challenges that the meat industry, particularly the small to medium-sized processors, face and can realize with the implementation of a traceability system within their business. So the, Ontar the Ontario Independent Meat Processors is a representative voice of the independent meat and poultry processor in Ontario. We work closely with agriculture and commodity organizations in the various levels of government, and we have been doing that for over 30 years. Our vision is to provide leadership for Ontario's meat and poultry industry by fostering innovation, promoting food safety and integrity, and recognizing excellence. Our mission is to strengthen Ontario's meat and poultry industry by working on behalf of stakeholders, responding to challenges, and identifying opportunities on behalf of our membership. Our objective is to ensure the continued growth of the meat industry through communication, education, training, promotion, and government support. UIMP is a recognized voice of authority that focuses on opportunities to improve the meat industry and its reputation. And, on, and one of those um, opportunities, of course, is including traceability. There are many pressures on the industry to adopt full traceability systems. We have the regulatory framework. So in the federal system, we have the Meat Inspection Regulations 1990. Um, so you can see here, it's saying that we need to develop and implement written procedures for recalling your meat products and that you have to maintain records for distribution. In Ontario, we have Regulation 3105. That's the Provincial Regulatory Authority. Um, so we have to maintain records. We have to have a recall procedure, much uh, similar to the federal system. And now we have more traceability. So that was a regulatory framework. But we have other pressures for traceability. So we have our consumers. Consumers are at the end of a long line of stops that food makes before reaching their plate. Being able to trace this food back to its origins can be crucial to government ind and industry during a food-related recall or outbreak. But consumers may also want to know whether what they are about to consume is organic, whether it's local, or maybe because of their beliefs if it's kosher or halal. So while food companies might benefit from traceability and government may demand it, Food traceability is in large part about building relationships with consumers and giving them what they really want, the ability to trust what they know they are eating. So we have accessing domestic markets. Leading private sector firms' requirements that private standards be met by their suppliers is also driving the adoption of traceability systems in the food sector. The Global Food Safety Initiative is just one such private standard. Retailers such as Loblaws and Walmart now require a company to adopt GFSI before they will consider them as a supplier. GFSI requires that suppliers develop and maintain acceptable traceability standards that trace one step forward and one step back, as well as keep records of lots or batches of all products and packaging materials used in the production process. 
Food traceability is also an issue of concern globally, and a number of countries and regions have adopted regulations requiring traceability for some or all food products. This has a significant impact on Canadian companies and producers looking to export their products to these countries. Success in global food markets requires Canadian exporters to demonstrate that Canadian traceability standards match or exceed those in other countries. Recent high-profile food safety incidents raise a consumer awareness of food safety issues. Food safety incidents cost companies not only significant dollars in, in recall expenses and disposed products, but also impact brand integrity, future sales, and consumer confidence. Implementation of a full traceability system will assist in the rapid identification and removal of potentially unsafe products from the marketplace, thereby reducing consumer exposure and impact. In animal health issues, we recently just saw another case of BSE pop up in um, Alberta, which was on the coattails of avian influenza that was found in British Columbia. So these are um, animal health issues are major factors in the decline of consumer confidence in food producers and regulatory agencies. The adoption of traceability, along with regular testing of animals, enables authorities to quickly identify the sources of potential animal or, health or, animal or human health hazards, limiting the chances of wider spread of disease. Being able to participate in the global food supply means ensuring that every participant meets the expectations of the others. Therefore, Canadian companies must be able to demonstrate that their traceability systems are comparable to those countries they wish to sell to. As well, with the increased use of imported ingredients in the manufacture of further processed meat products, such as spices, seasonings, and casings, it is equally important to ensure that each participant in the supply chain has a robust traceability system in the event of a food safety or animal health incident. So with all of these pressures on industry to adopt full traceability, you may ask yourself, why haven't all food processors, especially meat processors, already have them in place? Well, it's because there's several challenges facing the small and medium enterprise meat industry, the SMEs. So food traceability can be divided into three blocks. There's backward traceability, which corresponds with knowing the source for every product or component. There's process traceability, which corresponds with knowing the detailed composition for every prepared product. And there's forward traceability. This focuses on knowing who the clients are that received the product. The first and third block of trace. OK, so oh, sorry, I've, I've missed this point. So the complexity of the meat processing industry, there's challenges of data management throughout the chain due to the complexity of the meat industry. So we have a lot of different things going on there. So the first and third block of traceability are usually included in a plant's recall plan, which is mandated usually by regulation or third-party contract requirement, and are one step forward and one step backward. Plants use their purchase receipts and receiving records to keep track of what comes in, and they use sales receipts and distribution records to account for what goes out. But what about the stuff that happens in between receiving and shipping? Process traceability is probably the most overlooked aspect of traceability, most likely because it is the most complex. Meat processing is unique in comparison with other manufacturing sectors as it is a disassembly process. That is, rather than assembling inputs into a final product as is done in most manufacturing processes, an animal entering a processing plant is actually broken down into many parts or cuts, and then these parts are then reassembled with the same or similar cuts from other animals, and then typically placed in a box for shipment. There are many challenges of data management through the process due to this complexity. So here we have an image of a hog carcass. Um, we're taking one raw material, as you can see here, um, one 880 pound dress carcass, and now we're breaking it down to a potential of 29 individual primal cuts that can then be further processed down into retail cuts. Throughout the process, there is the opportunity for the addition of other inputs such as seasonings, breadings, casings, water, vegetables, cheeses, other meat proteins, etc., all of which need to be included in a plant's traceability system as they pose their own food safety risk. 
So now we have a typical sausage formulation. So you can see from this sausage formulation that one product, just one end product, can actually contain numerous inputs. This one in particular has 14 raw material inputs. So again, demonstrating the complexity of what we're manufacturing in the food and meat industry. So we have some more challenges. We've got the cost of implementation. So um, we need to understand what it is, how much, how much it's going to cost us, and what is that return on our investment. So traceability must not impede a company's competitiveness, ensuring that traceability costs are effective yet affordable, and that traceability's value to industry outweighs the cost to companies that pay for it. For many smaller firms, the financial incentives are not large enough to induce them to invest in a costly trace electronic traceability system. These would include the entry costs of buying the technology, such as the hardware and the software, the potential impact on production efficiency, and the need to train staff to operate it. There's also this fear of technology. Many of the small meat plant operators still don't even have a computer in the plant, and some not even in their home. These older generation owners still rely on the collection of information, such as purchase receipts for raw materials and invoices for finished products. These systems are essentially manual, relying on paper records and spreadsheets, and are low cost and relatively simple. However, this means that the information collection leaves many gaps throughout the process. Sorry about that. So over the past few years, automated traceability has become a virtual necessity to reduce industry, regulatory, and customer pressure pressures. However, with this necessity also comes opportunity, which if realized can add value to not only your process, but also to your business. So I think Wayne is going to go on to discuss the benefits in further detail during his presentation, so I'm going to pass this back on to him. Awesome. Thanks, Daphne. So as we, as we just heard from Daphne, as, as a meat processor, there's a lot of challenges uh, associated with achieving an efficient traceability system. Uh, meat processing is a sophisticated business when it comes to tracking production within the four walls of your plant. But if you take the time and effort to employ the right processors and processes the right tools and technology, um, traceability can yield some very, very compelling uh, benefits. Um, I also want to remind everyone that traceability itself is not an independent um, solution. It is actually the byproduct of a good plant floor production and data collection system, uh, such as Carlisle Symphony, but we'll go into that a bit later. A bit later. Um, that's because of the incredible amount of data um, that you're going to collect and contain. Um, you're going to collect all sorts of information about where your inputs came from, what happened to them within the four walls of your plant, and where they ultimately went, like Daphne was saying. Um, it is this data combined with the right tools that provides you the uh, benefits and the ROI. Um, some of those are, you know, the, obviously the, the rapid identification and containment of a tainted product, minimizing your company and your consumer risk. But outside of the recall benefits, uh, you know, traceability will help you actually help grow um, your supply chain uh, by actually being able to uh, deal with partners, uh, actually more sophisticated partners that actually have tighter recall requirements. Um, you'll be able to leverage the data and reporting tools um, you know, that your system will have to gain really interesting insights into your operational efficiencies or deficiencies as they may be, such as production output, yields, giveaway, or production goals, and compare them per production line if you have multiple production lines. Um, taking action on this data, the data will help you a lot um, to go very far to reduce your production costs and improve efficiencies. Um, You'll have just out of the, the, the gate much better inventory management as well. Um, your inventory will be in real time. You know how much you've got and when. Um, and then you also you can use the, uh, the, 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 the concept that you have the automated traceability tools to actually improve your corporate brand, you know, help market your company and your products as being safe, healthy, you know, sourced locally. Um, that also, um, if you use that in the right way, will help you improve your margins as well. And, and also, um, you know, you can experience a fairly rapid ROI with your traceability system as, you know, quite often most systems will pay for themselves within the very first recall these days or with the newfound efficiencies and cost savings you'll get from leveraging the data within. 
I also like to tell our customers as a don't, as, as, you know, this is the fact that don't look at traceability as an added cost these days, um, but it should be considered an enabler to your company's long-term success. So pretty much, you know, you've, you've, you've heard us talk about some of the traceability challenges and benefits. Let's get into now, you know, what you need to do. So we've talked about the need to automate. Um, well, in order to streamline your traceability data collection uh, with automation, it's, a, it's important to identify the basics that are required. Um, you'll need to be able to identify each item you receive from your supply chain partners. Um, a label containing a GS1 PAR code is probably the most widely accepted form of product identification today. Um, other methods include the use of RFID tags for the receipt of cattle um, tattoos uh, that are used commonly for receiving pork and others. Um, you'll need to be able to track a food item's movement or transformation throughout your warehouse or plant. Uh, so barcode readers, Im image scanners, um, RFID readers are all typical for this. Um, then as you've been labeling and tracking all of your product's movement, you'll need software to make sense of all this data. And uh, uh, the automated reporting systems contained with, within today's manufacturing execution suite, so you, otherwise known as MES systems, um, enterprise resource planning systems like ERP systems you hear about, this includes things like SAP. And for the small and medium-sized businesses, uh, is, the, is the more affordable and meat-specific plant floor and traceability solutions like Carlisle Technology provides make it possible to quickly and more easily determine uh, exactly which lots were contaminated, what those lots were made from, and ultimately where you got the products from to make up those lots. Uh, by identifying the contaminated lots precisely, recalls can be done faster and with greater accuracy, and in most cases at way less expense. Or another way to look at what I just said is to enable an efficient automated traceability system, you'll need label printers to label the incoming product. Um, you know, to, need to capture and track the movement of your products, you're going to need to use barcode scanners, uh, imagers, RFID readers. Um, they'll also record like the GTIN, lot numbers, on outbound orders, on, and uh, this is actually um, you know, used on mobile computers. Um, scales are key uh, to the value proposition so you can confirm the weight of incoming product, weight ingredients uh, to production runs, weigh your packaged goods or your finished goods. Um, and you'll need to move this information around, and given its incredible low cost and flexibility today, um, wireless technology is actually the most effective way to get your data from place to place. Um, it allows that and, and gives you incredible freedom to move and reuse the same assets. Like, feel free to move your, your mobile computers, uh, scanners, and scales throughout the workstation or throughout your facility because you've got the freedom now with wireless. And then now, um, you've got all this information being collected You'll need software that actually has a database to put all this information to work. Um, it's important to note that a traceability uh, software solution does way more than simply handle recalls. In reality, it actually runs your production, right from order entry, receiving, tracking your processing, handling your packaging, and your finished good labeling, um, inventory management, shipping, and way, way more. Um, then you'll need a place to put all your traceability applications uh, with, its, uh, with, it, with its database. And this is typically what servers for. That's the box at the bottom there. And pretty much there you have the basic building blocks for any automated traceability solution. So now you know what tools you're going to need. Um, to utilize those tools, you'll probably need a process. <clears throat> so like we briefly discussed on last month's webinar, uh, before evaluating a traceability solution, I strongly suggest mapping each unique process um, using a simple process flow diagram. It'll actually reveal a lot about your current readiness as well. Um, first, think about the major activities taking place in your organization. Uh, list each of these distinct parts in, uh, of the business in separate boxes. Um, typically, I find a flow chart format seems to be the best. Um, use whatever you're comfortable with. Um, number each activity to help identify and reference each in your traceability protocol. Um, within a single activity, there may be different types of inputs and outputs being used and produced, and therefore, uh, maybe uh, different types of information being collected. Um, it, it may be necessary to identify and separate these different types of inputs and outputs for the purpose of clear protocol writing. For example, receiving and storing inputs include all the products, consumables, and materials needed to complete the activities that will take place within your operation. Uh, even though these inputs are all received into the same operation, different employees may manage each input and the information may be captured and capped differently. Next, you'll simply want to list all of your inputs and outputs. So list all the inputs and outputs that will be used uh, by simply adding them to the process diagram you built earlier. 
uh, inputs are basically all of the required products, consumables, and materials that will be needed to complete each activity. And outputs are the work in progress or finished products and byproducts produced by the activity. And true traceability occurs when you can track the output of one activity to the input of the next. So like we said earlier, um, to be able to do that, um, you're going to need some sort of software to make sense of that. And I'm just going to go back in the slides here because you're going to see, for example, the similarities of, you know, we, we start your process diagram. You're going to start at receiving and storing, and you're going to end up picking and uh, shipping your order. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Carlisle Symphony, which is our plant productivity and traceability software, does the exact same thing. The moment you receive your product, uh, we basically start the tracking. We do everything that you, uh, you would do within your process, even some quality control. We collect some HACCP data. So that could be truck conditions, cleanliness, um, anything to do with temperature readings. Um, we actually will you know, track and actually have modules, control whip or advanced whip if you're a further processor. Um, we get into all the packaging, so assigning weights, lot numbers, and serial numbers. Um, and then we've got a very, very sophisticated inventory control system and then also have shipping uh, capabilities as well, which we'll get into. So again, you see again how we're starting with receiving and ending at shipping again. And like Daphne says, you're, you're, you're basically your, your orders and then who you ship to are your actual uh, step forward, step, step back traceability. And let Carlisle really worry about everything going on in the middle. And so now, you know, the, the best way to demonstrate any tool is to take you through a scenario. Um, this also looks suspiciously similar, it's familiar to the uh, process diagram we would have just ma mapped out earlier. So in this case, let's take a high-level approach to a beef processor and uh, how that scenario would work with Carlisle Symphony. Um, this scenario is from a real customer of ours, so it's not something we made up. It's actually something that's really in the marketplace today. However, I'd like to note, um, from my experience, um, I have yet to see two meat companies have the exact same approach to meat processing. This means their processes that they've had in place for years. So it's really important that your traceability vendor that you choose to work with um, has got a highly configurable um, piece of software that's to not significantly impact or change the way that you're currently doing business and also not to be uh, really foreign to your employees so it's easier to train them on it. Um, so the scenario we're about to take you through um, will already take for granted that you've already ordered your cattle and it, it picks up uh, at the moment they arrive at your plant. Um, then it'll take you through a basic disassembly process and then uh, all of its associated data collection right through to the shipping and the finished good product. So let's start off with receiving. So depending on what level of processing you're doing, uh, your materials arrive in different forms. Um, sometimes your material will walk right in your, into your facility. Um, other times, depending on, on what you're processing, it'll arrive in combos or boxes. Uh, with beef, it typically walks in. It's, uh, it's usually in possession of an RFID tag as well. Um, just going back in time, since September 1st of 2006, um, all cattle um, leaving their herd of origin must be tagged with a CCIA-approved RFID. That's a radio frequency identification tag. Um, tags are distributed through authorized uh, dealers and, and registered to the producer. Um, the tag can be placed in either the ear of the animal um, or actually in either ear of the animal, except in Quebec where the cattle must be tagged and the animal's right here. Um, it's always, the Quebecers always do things a little bit different. Um, and then if it doesn't walk into your facility, um, typically um, the product has been, uh, has slaughtered and cut uh, prior to its arrival. So it typically arrives in combos uh, or boxes that are ready for processing. Um, these will usually be identified with a GS1 barcode. So to get the data collection process started, um, when receiving, you first want to associate the ear tag with the live weight of the animal. Uh, to do this, um, you would have had scanned the, uh, the RFID tag with an RFID, RFID reader. It typically comes in the form of a wand. Sometimes there's panels that are on the side of the pen. Um, and these readers will typically associate the weight uh, uh, with the animal's tag. Um, and, and from there, you've actually got your connection. So associating this data actually has its uh, advantages as, uh, as a system like Symphony provides the flexibility to perform settlement reports based upon the, uh, the live animal weight. Or if you prefer, uh, you can actually uh, further down the process, which we'll get to, um, the hot scale weight uh, could be your, your method of uh, reconciliation as well. Um, but we'll get to those in, in, in further slides. But uh, also interestingly as well, at this point as well, um, Symphony's costing module 
uh, enables you to integrate with uh, web-based industry market pricing websites that automatically associate current market pricing to your inventory, which can help uh, aid in calculating the market cost of your product. So here to tell you a little bit more about how it works in the Symphony is Gavin. Thanks, Wayne. Um, on the screen there, you can see a screenshot from the animal receiving application in the Carlisle Symphony system. At this point, we are recording basic information such as the vendor that the animals came from, uh, the truck that it arrived in, the name of the carrier, and how many head you've received. Um, and as Wayne said, there are several ways you can do settlement. Um, one of the basic ways to do it is at receiving, you can enter in a purchase price, how much you paid for those animals um, per uh, kilogram or per pound, depending on how you receive them. We also have the ability to track uh, basic HACCP information at this stage as well. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen there, you can see some truck information and questions. This area is configurable. Um, you can ask basically whatever questions you want here. So you can record basic information like how clean was the truck, how clean are the animals when they're coming in, are they in good condition, is there any noticeable uh, lameness in the animals, were they mistreated in, the, uh, in traveling, all that sort of information can be recorded here as well. Very good. Thanks, Gavin. So following the removal of the uh, hide, it is a requirement under uh, the Health of uh, Animals regulation that the animal ID uh, tag uh, be attached to the carcass to maintain its unique identity. Uh, typically, the head is also tagged uh, before separation from the carcass and prepared for inspection. That's for Canadian food inspections, the uh, rules up here in Canada. So the, the way Symphony works, it works in tandem with ICAP. Um, which is Carlisle's uh, data collection software that operates on touchscreen PCs or harsh environments, stainless steel uh, washdown workstations like the one seen above. By uh, leveraging the data uh, captured device like a scanner, or in this case an RFID reader, um, ICAP captures and records the lot number, the tag information, and the associated weight of the animal. Um, since many of you receive your inputs in different ways, it can sometimes be a little difficult to keep your animals organized by lot number. Um, generally, we, we recommend to our producers to keep their lots separate in order to simplify receiving, but if you can't, uh, don't worry. Um, Symphony does have the ability to handle mixed lots of product, given its ability to associate the tag to the lot number or the specific animal. Now, to tell you a little bit more about how the, uh, the, this part of the, the software works is, is Gavin again. Thanks, Wayne. Um, one thing I forgot to mention on the previous slide is the receiving application generates a receiving lot number. That's the lot number that's going to track those animals as they are proceeding through your facility. So in the screenshot that came up on the bottom half of the screen here, you can see in the top right-hand corner there's the lot number. Um, that's the current lot that's being recorded through the kill station um, at this point in time. And like Wayne mentioned, we can handle uh, mixed lots uh, or if a lot is kept together. We record the ear tag at the receiving uh, as it walks into the um, barn, so we know for a given lot what ear tags are associated with that. And we also scan those ear tags again at the uh, kill station, so that we now have a record between the weight of the animal as it's either being killed or before it was killed, so we have the option to capture either a live weight or a near live weight, depending on what your settlement is. And you can also see that on the screen there we have animal types. So we're recording all the basic information from the animal as it's being slaughtered, ready to be processed into the next step in the, in the process. Cool. Thanks, Gavin. So depending on your process as well, um, you, you may or may not have a vet station, uh, otherwise known as a demerit inspection or weighing station. Um, this occurs after the hot scale, but depending on your process, sometimes I've seen people do it before. Um, but to optimize your reconciliation process with your processor uh, or your producer, you'd likely want to capture your demerits and associate them back to the original animal. Um, ICAP has the ability to, to prompt you for uh, capture and associate a variety of demerits, such as abscesses or age attributes and things like that. Um, so on a settlement report, um, you can collect data in one of the three buckets, uh, either for the producer, the processor, or the regulatory agency, which is you know, otherwise known as your government. Um, and Gavin, did, did you have any more on, on how this works there? Sure, Wayne. On the, this screen here is completely configurable. It is up to the producer, um, or sorry, the, yeah, I guess producer is the right term, to configure the buttons that you see on the screen there, depending on what information they want to track. 
Um, so for example, you can see here we have a, a button set up for abscess, a button set up for a CFIA condemn, and a button set up for an OTM marker. Not only can we track demerits, but we can also uh, track any attributes that you wish to apply to the animal. So for example, the OTM, that's not necessarily a demerit, but you do want to know if the animal's an OTM. If you have a, a vet that is uh, looking at the teeth or other markers on the animal to determine whether it is over 30 months or under 30 months, you do want to uh, make note of that on the animal as well. If there is anything that the vet needs to cut off the animal um, with respect to, say, an abscess or something, this station can be hooked up to a scale so that the abscess can be weighed and you'll know exactly what you're pulling off of the carcass. You can also use this, like Wayne said, for settlement. You can, uh, on the report that you print out and give back to the farmer, you can say, okay, carcass A had, you know, demerit this, demerit this, and we had to cut off this amount of weight, so we're going to dock you X amounts uh, per pound. Great. Thanks, Gavin. So the last step before your carcass hits the cooler, oops, we jumped out again. The PowerPoint's having fun with me today. Let me jump back in there again. All right, hopefully that's all good. So the last step before your carcass hits the cooler is what the industry refers to as the hot scale. Um, this weighing process occurs when the animal has been hung and dressed and trimmed. Um, the animal would now possess a carcass tag per side, which has a connection back to the original animal's ear tag scanned at receiving. So the weight of the animal carcass to be processed is captured typically by a rail scale, which is that picture right at the bottom. Um, this scale works by weighing your hung carcass and feeding the information into the ICAP station where its weight and which side of beef is associated with the carcass ID tag. Like, and here's an example of a carcass tag, um, and it's information map that usually includes uh, information pertaining to the lot number, uh, the Julian date, uh, the side of the carcass, uh, which is identified there, and then also the, the kill sequence. And also note that the system is now associating the, uh, the two sides uh, back to the same carcass ID number, uh, which in turn uh, traces back to the original animal number. So, so Gavin, you have some more information on this at the, the screen here. Okay, you'll notice that the screen that came up at the bottom looks very similar to the previous screens we've shown you. Um, one of the nice things about the Carlisle system is we try and keep things standard so that anyone that learns one system in the process can be flipped between other stations uh, and pick up the process relatively quickly. The tracking tag that we have on the screen there as well, um, as Wayne noted, we do denote the side that's being dealt with as well. Some animals, cattle for example, are normally split down the middle and they will have a, a side one and a side two. So we track those sides independently as they go through the process. Other animals, um, hogs for example, I think, are generally not split. They will not have a side one and a side zero. They will just be termed side zero, sorry. They won't have a side one or a side two. They will only have a side zero, which is what we use to denote that it's a complete carcass. And through this station as well, you can see we are still tracking the animal type. We are still tracking the weight of each side. And now instead of having the RFID tag, because that no longer is with the animal, we've attached a carcass uh, tracking ID to follow the animal through the process. And this is tied back to the RFID tag and then back to the vendor that it came from in the database. Nice, thanks. Great, so after the hot scale, your carcasses will uh, do their time in the cooler. Um, Symphony uh, has a unique feature that allows for, uh, for, for product holds. Um, in today's beef example, uh, a couple of certain, you, you could tag a, a certain carcasses uh, to age for a particular duration of time, maybe for a particular customer that you've got. Uh, perhaps that customer likes to buy beef from you that's aged for 28 days per se or something like that. Um, Symphony enables you to tag those carcasses, not only physically, but also the system will not let you scan those items back out of the cooler until the whole time has either been satisfied or a management overrides this. Once your carcasses have done their time in the cooler, though, they are ready to hit the, kidding, uh, the cutting floor. Um, interestingly, uh, there are some additional pieces of information um, you could collect as well, um, such as grading. And so if you actually have invested in a grading system, um, Carlisle can actually automate the collection of that grading information and add it to your animal's data trail as well. 
Um, so yeah, Symfony can integrate with third-party grading information tools in software so that grading information is automatically collected and then actually applied back to your, your traceability process back to that animal. Um, again, this can be really useful to simplify and impact settlement reports and statements. Next, looking very much like the hot scale, is the cold scale. Uh, the cold scale is, in, is uh, important as uh, the carcass will weep or drip, as it's, uh, as it's called, uh, when it's in the, the cooler. Um, this always results in a reduction of, uh, of weight, uh, typically referred to as shrinkage. Um, so you, you accurately know what you're about to cut from. It's highly advisable to collect the cold weight of your carcass before assigning it to the cutting process. Um, this will enable the Symphony system to more accurately provide yield, costing, and profitability reports. In addition, we, we have larger processors using this information to verify their production numbers as well. So this is kind of an interesting angle to take on this. Um, they'll compare the carcass count at their vet station with the count at the hot scale and the cold scale numbers. Um, this helps improve accuracy of their production counts and also helps determine if, if product gets left behind or forgotten in the cooler. And uh, Gavin, do you have anything to add about this slide here? This screen, just like many of the other ones, looks fairly similar. Um, we are tracking the same sort of information, weight, animal type, carcass ID, et cetera, and it gives you a better representation of what's actually going out into your cut floor. The, uh, this weight that's being recorded here in conjunction with the hot weight that was recorded at the hot scale, like Wayne said, will give you your shrinkage that was lost in the cooler, and also this weight that's recorded here will be the starting weight that you will compare your yielding against when you're actually cutting your pieces of meat from this carcass. Awesome, thank you. So now we're finally at the cutting process where you build the products you'll be selling to your customers. Um, this is also where traceability can get a little difficult for a lot of systems out there. Um, this is partly based on your disassembly process and partly on how granular you'd like your traceability information to be. Um, we like to say traceability can either be easy, um, but a little vague, or with a little more work, uh, the right processes and the right system in place, uh, your traceability can get as granular as you want it. Um, the range here we are typically talking about is typically traceability that can span from a day's production right down to traceability right down to the specific animal. Um, so we're not here to take the easy route, so we're going to tackle option two and go for the granular traceability right down to the animal. Um, well, why? Well, in today's beef processing market where working on ever-increasing um, pricing, uh, margins are getting tighter, and increasing customer demand for safer, healthier food, there are some advantages of going the extra mile. Um, those can include, you know, looking for a, a marketing edge, so companies that, you know, are looking to get, you know, really get their, their brand or their products well known. Um, are, they're starting to employ uh, QR or TD barcodes for tracking a product back to a farm or maybe a buy local uh, information website. Um, it's also processors looking to differentiate their brands uh, just, just with the, uh, again, the, uh, the healthier, safer, locally sourced uh, product to add value to their um, their products and typically that value is that it comes in the, the form of added margins, so increased margins. Um, also the ability to deal with more upscale or healthy retailers. Um, this is beneficial when dealing with things like people like Whole Foods and stuff like that. Um, and then the data collected can be used to better manage uh, costs or, or analyze to make better business decisions, for example, production efficiency or quality by supplier, example, or just basically similar information like that. So the scenario we're going into is, is, a, is basically a cutting pod based processor. So this is uh, more or less after chilling the, uh, the carcass, um, the, the carcasses are assigned to a particular cutting pod. This is like a butcher-like cut down. Um, the carcass is totally cut up in the finished, in, into finished goods or pieces or trim right within that pod. Um, all the pieces will retain a traceability back to the cutting pod which connects to the carcass and then ultimately back to the original animal again. And uh, Gavin's got a little bit more he'd like to say about this. So the way we maintain traceability in a situation like this is on the screen there you notice we are tracking the carcass uh, ID. This is what we use for maintaining traceability. We turn this into a batch run number. So as this animal, sorry, as this side is being cut up at the cutting pod, this 
uh, the, the tracking tag that followed the animal all through the kill facility, through the hot scale, through the uh, cooler exit, the cold scale, all that sort of stuff. That tag is still staying with the pieces as they're being cut up. It's turning into a batch run number, and once we get to the next step in the process, the piece weighing station, you'll see how that number um, comes into effect. But that information, this cutting pod, ha can maintains the link between the pieces that are being cut up back to the carcass that it came from. Great. Thanks, Gavin. So back in the uh, cutting pod scenario now, the, the pieces are portioned out in the same area like we were talking about earlier, and then you could, then your piece tracking could go one of two ways. Um, the first way is you could produce non-labeled pieces, so just basically pieces that you haven't bothered to weigh or label separately, um, and simply put them into cartons, almost like bulk-like packaging, uh, and then you just simply label, simply label the carton. Um, or um, the, the second uh, method is all of the pieces get individually weighed and labeled um, as serialized pieces. Um, labels uh, then have the ability to sport two or 3D barcodes uh, or sorry, 2D or QR barcodes, as they're technically called, um, again, like we were talking about earlier, that contain marketing information or information about the producer, uh, the farmer, or even retail-specific information. Um, this method would provide more granular traceability at the piece level. And then when labeling pieces, uh, you should use a weigh label workstation, which would normally include a Something, in, if it was definitely in a wash down environment, you definitely want a, high, a harsh environment touchscreen where it works screen computer, uh, running Carlisle's ICAP software, um, which would, that, that, that uh, workstation would contain the, the production and all of your product files. Um, this would be attached to a scale to capture the weight and then also a label printer to print out your finished good label. And uh, Gavin's going to take a look, talk a little bit more about this process uh, as we load the screenshot here for the piece uh, wing uh, application. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Uh, the first thing I want you to notice on the screen there is there is a box labeled batch run number. If you look at the number that's in that box, you'll notice it is identical to the previous screenshot that we saw that was labeled as a carcass ID. This is how we maintain, sorry, maintain traceability, like I mentioned earlier. Once you scan that tag that has come up with the pieces, now every piece that you produce on this station will be associated to that batch run number, which is obviously the carcass ID, so you know which animal it came from. And in the system, because we know the carcass ID, we also know the vendor that it came from, so we know exactly where that animal came from as well. On the screen, you will notice that it's... Um, Touchscreen based, it's got large buttons for you to pick your pieces from, so it makes it quite easy for you to select your pieces as well. If you were doing traceability that's not quite as granular, if you were doing, say, perhaps one batch run number per day, in ability, but you're probably increasing a little bit of uh, volume and output that you can process. Back to you, Wayne. Uh, thanks, Gavin. All right, so get you, to get your pieces packaged for shipping, you'll want to get them into their cartons now. Uh, then to maintain trackability for inventory and traceability, you'll need to label the product. So just like in labeling, uh, when we were talking about labeling pieces, uh, you should use a weigh label workstation. And then just like we discussed on the pieces, uh, Symphony will print a serialized carton label. Um, these labels should leverage the GS1128 standard and will contain the, uh, the G10, otherwise known as the Global Trade Identification Number, uh, the production weight, um, or sorry, the production date, sorry, um, the weight of the carton, and the serial number of the box. Uh, one of the major advantages of serialized carton labels is just uh, increased uh, traceability. Um, the same application will also build your, your pallets and pallet labels, which we're actually not going to cover today, but it gives you an idea. And uh, I think Gavin's got a bit more to say on how this works as well. Thanks, Wayne. Um, the big thing that I want you to notice or about this uh, station here is the fact that we're now tracking the pieces into a carton. As the carton is being assembled, the pieces are being scanned as they're being put into the carton. So the serial number that gets generated for the carton we will have a record of that in the database. We know exactly what piece went into that, and because we know where the pieces came from, 
via the batch run number or carcass ID. We know where that animal came from, the farm, et cetera. So we know exactly what pieces were in the box and what farm they came from. Awesome. Thanks, Gavin. So now that you've built your product, uh, most beef processors are either building to order, which means you have outstanding orders for your product and you're simply building pallets to satisfy those orders, or you're building to inventory, which your pickers will pick uh, those orders uh, later as, as your orders come in to satisfy those. Um, the inventory management in, in Carlisle Symphony is engineered for the specific needs of a meat processor. Uh, what I mean by that is it possesses uh, uh, features such as the support for multiple warehouses or zones within your warehouse. Um, also, uh, local or third-party uh, uh, storage facilities, like a cold storage facility, and physical locations within those warehouses for the ease of finding your product when you need to. Um, it also supports sound uh, cycle counting in those areas, too. Um, it also provides support for inventory holds and also can limit product movement. So if you need to hold a product uh, because maybe it's waiting for lab results or the product needs to age, or even if the product's deemed part of a recall, the system will put the product on hold and no one can scan it out of inventory until the condition changes. Um, the system, uh, by default, works uh, to support FIFO, which is your basic first in and first out. And since uh, Symphony is fully integrated, uh, you'll not only have real-time insight into your inventory, but also know what it's currently worth in real time as well if you actually have our costing module running there too. And then uh, it also supports uh, something called uh, uh, flexible customer-driven date codes. Um, uh, and basically what that means is some customer will accept older, pro you know, some, you, basically you have some product or customers that will accept older product. Well, and you know these customers, versus those other customers that always demand the freshest stuff from you. So you, we, we provide that capability for you to do that uh, and support those customers as well. So I'll let the uh, next couple of slides now, we're going to go into a little bit more about uh, our inventory reports. And uh, Gavin's going to talk to you a little bit about those reports now. Thanks, Wayne. Um, in the Symphony system, there are many, many reports that will go into uh, information on what you currently have in inventory. Uh, the two reports that I'm going to go through right now are a basic inventory uh, by location. And we've got two different versions of this report. The first one you see here is a summary. Basically, this report will just give you um, absolute numbers. So, for example, you can see at the top of the screen there, in location 000000, you have six boxes of utility 90% trim, um, no pallets with a net weight of 185 uh, kgs. Um, there's actually a price input there, and so you know the value of the product that you have in that location is a, just over $1,000. So this report gives you basic, uh, basic information. It doesn't have detail on it, but it gives you um, numbers so you have an idea of what you actually have in stock. And then the detail version of this report here, this is uh, generated for the same data that was on the previous report, but this one's actually detailed. So you can see here at the top of the screen, we're still looking at location 000000. Those six boxes of utility 90% trim are now listed individually because each box has its own separate serial number. Um, and you can see that listed there. You can see the production date, so you know exactly when it was made. Um, and you can actually see the net weight of each box individually. So this report is, again, very similar to the one previous, except it breaks it down by specific um, information. So if you wanted to know how much product you have that is, um, was made on a certain day, you can find that using a report very similar to this one. Perfect. So great. So you know, now that we've covered inventory, um, the, the the last piece really of of, of anything is now uh, shipping. You know, so so when shipping, um, Symphony basically, uh, since it's been tracking everything through, it's handled your orders and all that sort of stuff, will generate all of your shipping records, um, such as your truck logs, your packing slips, your invoices, pretty much anything that you're going to you know, more or less have go with that truck or go with that order, and then reconcile all that information if you need it to with your current accounting package or your ERP system if you happen to use one of those as well. So it's a seamless integration with whatever current accounting systems you're currently running. This also, this information also becomes your trace forward data there as well, which, which is great. 
and then pretty much um, you know as we've been talking about this there's been a lot of data we've been collecting and this is just really a short list of the uh, the, the data that uh, uh, that Carlisle Symphony has been connecting uh, collecting throughout the process and uh, it, it, there was actually too much to list here so we just kind of highlighted some of the stuff so obviously everything from the original receipt of the, the tag information from the animal so it's farm of origin which is the lot number ear tag the carcass ID tag Everything from animal weights to product weight, or sorry, yeah, to piece weights to final product weights, carton weights, um, that's all there. Your demerits, um, your basic HACCP data, uh, your market pricing, your costs, um, even your pricing is all tracked in here. Um, how many products were produced, um, what products were produced and how many, uh, where they went and how many you still have on hand. Um, all associated transaction dates and then all the data you'll need uh, to essentially produce any traceability report you need again from your orders uh, to the sale to all of that magical production data that was done internally between the four walls of your plan and then to get access to that data um, you need reporting and uh, that's something Symphony comes with it comes with a very detailed reporting tool so um, out of the box you, you could look at the inventory reports uh, shipping reports obviously receiving and production reports those re re production reports get really interesting with things like yield reports and giveaway reports um, and then obviously you can actually you know track packaging by line or by shift. So more or less they, how they how did they uh, they perform? Um, we even have alert and escalate escalation. So if something happens or you actually have a production line go down or a workstation go offline or even a printer issue, um, the plant staff or the plant manager can be uh, you know notified sometimes even before the operators realize there's a problem. Um, we actually have digital dashboards for stats again that cover off things like yields, uh, your connectivity, are your are your workstations connected things like that. And then pretty much there, again, we all tie that together and with all that data being tied together, uh, we produce some very, very detailed traceability reports again. Um, and again, like Daphne was saying earlier, um, the importance to have reports that support trace back, trace forward, and what you've done internally um, is really, really important. So you can probably see where this is heading now. We've talked about we've got all this data. Well, now you've got a recall. You know, what do we do? So it's, it's, it's actually isn't too bad because you know, most of you have already experienced the mock recall, whether your retailer or your regulatory body did this. But as, uh, the most important thing is just actually have your recall action plan. Um, this is just a sample action plan. It's not necessarily the way to do it. It's just a, a way that uh, has been recommended by some regulatory bodies. But one of the most important things of this is actually being able to recall all the data um, that you need to associate with this. A lot of this action plan actually has to do with your contacting and your communications of your, your partners and uh, regulatory bodies, uh, press releases if you need to do them, things like that. But also to be, able to be able to do all that, you've got to know where everything uh, came from, um, you know, how much you sold, basically anything that was uh, a tainted product, uh, you're going to need to know this. So to talk uh, about some traceability reports, uh, Gavin's going to jump in and take you through some uh, different traceability reports here. Thanks, Wayne. <clears throat> um, I think we've got five reports here that we're going to cover um, in these next five slides here. The first three have to do specifically what we call um, recall reports. We have this report in three different levels. Basically, level one that you're looking at right here is detailed um, production, sorry, detailed information of all the products for one single PLU over a range of uh, production days. So as you can see here, we've got four main sections. You can tell if a product was deleted, um, if it was damaged or what have you, it'll show up in this section here. If it was sent to WIP, if it was sent to like uh, further processing uh, to turn, um, one product into another, it will show up in the WIP section. If it's currently still in stock, if it's in your cooler, your freezer, etc., it'll show up in the uh, third section there, and then shipped obviously will show up down in the bottom section. So here it will show you uh, what customer you've sent the product to, what the date was, what the order number was, etc., so you can follow that information along there as well. And you can see it's detailed information as well. So if you look at the third section where there's actually data showing up there, you can see the batch run number that was uh, that that product was produced under. You can see the carton serial number, uh, the weight. You can see what location it's actually sitting in, and you can actually see the production date and that sort of thing on that screen there as well. Cool. Okay. So this screen here, uh, very similar to the first one, it's got the same four sections on there, except this is a level two recall report. 
this report here is uh, all the products produced for a single production day. So multiple PLUs will show up on this report here, but it is just for one single production day. Now, um, notice that the, the information is very similar. It's still got the information like the batch run number if it was produced under a batch run number. You see the carton uh, serial number that's there as well. If the product is on a pallet, it'll be listed there. Um, again, weight, location, production date, all that sort of information is recorded as well. And then the third, um, third step in the, um, sorry, third level in the recall reports is all shipped products from a range of production dates. So if you want to get a little bit more information on the products that were shipped, this is the recall report that you'll look at. And you can see here, I've blurred out the names on here because this is actually data from a live customer. But you can see um, it gives you information on the product, the serial number, the order that it was attached to, the required date is actually the ship date, how many curtains were sent, and the batch run number that it was produced under as well. So now you've got an order number and a customer name that you can go track back and give them a call and let them know that there's an issue with some of the products they have. Okay, now this report showing up here, um, we call it the batch run number derivatives report. If you recall from earlier in the presentation, uh, we mentioned several times that we use batch run numbers for tracking um, individual pieces and cartons back to the carcass they came from, because that's the same as the carcass ID. Using that information, we can generate a report to show you everything that came from the batch run number or the carcass ID for that animal. So for example, in this report here, you can see from this batch run number, in stock, there's still a couple of boxes, some eye of the round, some uh, top sirloin that you can see there. Um, you can also see we have um, down at the bottom, some product that was shipped as well. Again, there's some blurred out sections there because this is live customer data. But in this report here, you can see at a glance from that animal what exactly happened to all the meat from it. So we've got some in stock and we can also see some down there shipped and you will have a customer name and a phone number that you can give them a call and let them know there's been an issue. Great. And the last report that I wanted to look into here, the first four reports showed you, um, back to Daphne's point, they showed you forward traceability and they showed you a little bit of process traceability. This report here will show you backwards traceability. So because the batch run number and the carcass ID number is the same, you're probably getting sick of hearing me tell you that, but mm -hmm. the, it's a big point because here, now you can see on this report, this is a killed in sequence report. So this report will show you what um, it's run for a given day and it shows you what animals were killed on that day. And it's important because the carcass ID that's on the screen there is the same as the batch run number that you would have seen in other reports. This report will also tell you what vendor um, provided those animals. It'll list it there. Again, it's grayed out. But you can also see weights and types and everything that's recorded on that screen as well. It will also show you the receiving lot number. So under the PO um, column there, that is the receiving lot number that you can now go back into your uh, receiving application that you saw at the very beginning of the presentation. And you can see a little bit more information about how many animals came in with that lot, et cetera, et cetera. Great, thanks. Well, thanks, Gavin. So as we kind of get into the home stretch here, let's, let's quickly summarize uh, some of the benefits again. So I want to remind everyone again that, that traceability itself, again, is, I talked about this earlier, but it's, it's not an independent solution. It, it is a byproduct of a good plant floor system. Um, and, and then that's become, because now I think you're get, understanding the amount of data that they we're actually collecting. Um, and, and, and when this data is combined with the right tool, um, it provides you the information you need when you need it. Um, so, so basically, you know, obviously there's some of the benefits, again, like this is a repeat slide from earlier, but obviously uh, what Gavin's just demonstrated is, is we can provide the data that you need when you need it. So basically it's going to expedite your investigation and minimize the implicated product because you can isolate it to certain production runs or maybe even to certain lines. Um, it helps you contain the product faster. And the reason why this is uh, all expedited is because these reports are in the system. Um, they're just there. They're a click away. You can generate these reports without going through the manual laborious process you'd normally do without a system of digging through files and files and files and making sense of your paperwork. 
they are literally just a click away. Um, and then out, outside of traceability, again, I just want to use this opportunity to, to remind you all that you know, this, this traceability system can help you grow your supply chain partners by meeting their tighter recall requirements. And I do know we have customers that have used their traceability system to demonstrate their recall capability and are now working with companies like Costco and Walmart. Um, you can also leverage the data and reporting tools again to make some interesting insights into your operational efficiencies. And I, and I do know we have customers, again, that have taken a look at their production lines um, and, and found some, some, some inefficiencies on them and actually used the data to correct that. And it's always it occurred that, you know, affecting their profitability in a very positive manner. Um, you'll always have much better inventory management. Like how nice it is to know how, how much inventory you've got on hand, where, where, wherever it is within the four walls of your plant, and actually what it's worth. Um, and this is all available to you in real time. And then if you're, if you're ambitious from a marketing perspective, you can leverage now um, you know, your, your traceability, the fact that you have a traceable traceability system, and you have the ability to do all this sort of stuff fast, and actually have the able, ability to implement things like 2D or QR barcodes uh, to help you, you know, market the fact you have safe, uh, healthy, or locally sourced food. And a lot of vendors uh, and, and uh, food processors are doing this to help improve their margins. And, and again, you know, I always tell people, all it takes is <clears throat> one really interesting recall and uh, the traceability system will pretty much pay for itself on the first recall. And if it doesn't, um, it's not, still not a bad investment uh, at all because if you use the data the way you should and look for efficiency and cost savings, um, it'll definitely pay for itself very, very quickly. And uh, I'll just uh, you know, I put this little piece up on the slide again uh, that, again, you know, don't, don't consider traceability a cost but a, an, an enabler to your company's long-term success. So basically, now that you've kind of like uh, you, you've heard everything there is to, to hear about traceability, you normally need to find a traceability partner, um, and this is probably the hardest thing for a processor to do. Is is actually you typically have people you've been buying scales from or buying your scanners from for years and things like that. But you know, having someone bring it all together with the right vision is another story. So when you're looking for a vendor, look for someone who's got years of experience in the market, and typically not just. Uh, someone who's a software vendor, but also someone who kind of does everything for you, the hardware, software, they're, they've got experience in years on the plant floor, so they understand what, actually what you're doing. Um, make sure they've got customers. Call their customers for references. Um, talk to their customers about, have you had a recall? Have you used the tool for it? Um, being a member of relevant trade associations, so Carlisle ourselves, we're, we're a member of the North American uh, Meat um, Association, as well as the Ontario Independent Meat Processors which Daphne represents here, and a whole bunch of other associations as well. But staying connected with those associations keeps us connected with the community and our thumb on the pulse of what's going on in the industry. Um, and definitely help bring some of that um, information and market intelligence back into our products so we can continue to make great products for you. And then obviously just having the product breadth and depth to meet your needs. Um, the software that you saw today is actually you know, the evolution of over 10 years of work. Um, it's hard for a new software company to come to market and offer the depth of software uh, features that you've seen today. Uh, strong reputation within the industry. Um, I'll show you a slide a bit later with who some of our customers are, but we, we, we work with very small to very large uh, meat processors. And this is something um, that uh, one of our um, customers actually used as a quote, and I actually threw it in here. Uh, it, it more or less said, um, and when we were kind of uh, engaging this customer, he goes, I, I really like you guys because you, you're not an accounting software company or just a pure software host, but you guys are experts who know the nuances of my business, my process, and my market, and that's why I'm trusting you. And that's actually one, that's, that's one of the big reasons we're in the market today and, uh, and why Carlisle's been around for 30 years. So here's my opportunity to do the shameless plug right now. So, so Carlisle has been doing this for over 30 years. Um, we provide the fully integrated solution. Um, so, and what we mean by that is do the hardware, software, um, ongoing support, the deployment services, on-site implementation, repairs, and all your software maintenance going forward. It's basically one 1-800 number to call for no matter what you're, what's going on in your plant floor. Um, and then again, our data collection methodology, which you saw some of it today, was cultivated from 30 years experience on the plant floor. We tried to make our data collection process very familiar to your processes. So we're not coming in and kicking your process out the door and saying this is something totally different, but do it for traceability. And then, like you heard me say, we're not an accounting package or an ERP system. We let those guys worry about that side. Um, we are just experts on what goes on in your plant floor. And uh, probably one of the most interesting things about Carlisle is just that we actually have a highly available architecture. And what I mean by that 
is just from our experience on the plant floor, is we realize that production is the most important thing to you. If you're not production and you're not in production, you're losing money, you're losing business. Um, so basically, the way we architected our system to work is that if you've got workstations out on the plant floor and you have a network issue or your server goes down, guess what? You're still in production. Those workstations run independently, still collecting all the data, keeping you in production, printing your labels, doing everything you need to do to ship your product. Um, and when your network comes back online or your server reboots, you're, everything just reconciles and you're good to go. And then, of course, from years of experience comes just the simplicity. Um, you know, we've developed our solutions to be easy. Gavin talked about you know, the very similar interface. Once you kind of learn one or two of our interfaces, everything's kind of the same from there. And then affordability. Um, it, it, these things, these solutions are a lot cheaper uh, than you would expect and far less costly than going, you know, getting a, an ERP vendor to extend their system down to the plant floor. And uh, from, from, you know, from that standpoint, you know, we, we, we like to say that uh, we, we are, our customers have a, you know, a healthy range of, uh, of, of size, ranging from small family-owned processors right up to North America's largest food processors. And to give you a quick idea, here's, here's who they are. Um, these are just some of the, the, the notable ones. We have hundreds of other customers, but here's the, the ones we're very proud to uh, exhibit their logos. And then we also like to think we've taken a bit of a leadership position as well um, by, by actually saying we've, we think we've wrote the book, or at least the dummies book, on traceability. Um, and uh, to go and get this book for free um, as part of this webinar, you can go to uh, carlisletechnology.com and follow the, uh, the, 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 the thread to get the free traceability book. And it'll be an e-book that's uh, emailed to you. So at this point, um, if you haven't already been doing so, I encourage you now, we're going to get into the QA uh, section of our webinar. If you've got questions you'd like answered, I encourage you to type them into the chat window on the right-hand side of your uh, GoToMeeting uh, um, uh, panel there. So while you guys are doing that, um, because my computer actually did a, a, mi a minor burp, I'm actually going to recall my, my, uh, my application right now so I can actually look at it the console. So give me a brief second there. back across. There we go. And then we'll go back into this mode. There we go. So while some of you are uh, asking your questions, I do have a, uh, a few questions to start here, actually. Um, so someone's asking, um, who do you find is driving traceability in the industry? Um, are you finding it's the, regulator, the regulators, um, the retailers, or other? Um, so I'll probably take that question. Um, the way I'm finding it right now is I, you know, initially when I first came on board, I thought it would be the regulators driving this. And it's not. It's, it's definitely the retailers, uh, progressive, especially the progressive retailers, like the Costco's, the Walmart's, the Loblaws of the world. Um, those guys are, are driving, um, uh, obviously, uh, traceability into their supply chain. And I think it's more so um, just to protect them. Uh, you know, obviously, if they can have a much faster response system throughout their entire supply chain, it minimizes, minimizes the impact of any recall. Plus, um, an added benefit of actually having a traceability system like Carlisle's is the, the um, ability to do EDI, which is electronic data exchange. And a lot of those uh, companies now want you to exchange information, like order information and shipping information with them electronically now. Um, and Carlisle gives you the ability to actually communicate with them on that level as well. So that's some of the nice advantages of that. Let's see, and we're looking now. I've got one, and one more question here. Is, uh, yeah, this is a good one. Uh, someone's asking, how much would a good traceability system cost me? Okay, now, as, as, as the director of sales here, I'm going to put my sales hat on. But um, all, I, all I can tell you right now is, is it, first off, it's not going to be as exp expensive as you think, but it actually is directly correlated to two things I mentioned earlier in the presentation. It's more or less, how big is your company? How many data collection points uh, will you require? And also, how granular do you want your traceability to be again? Um, and so, you know, like we've discussed, uh, you can actually have very, very uh, simple traceability right down to the day or very granular traceability right down to the animal, which uh, requires a lot more data collection, doing serialized labeling and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but if you do that, uh, there are definitely going to be price differences. Um, the, the, the software it itself, you know, um, it, any, any software solution is going to cost you some money to implement and stuff like that. 
Um, you know, I'm getting, going to throw a ballpark out right now, like a, a traceability solution will probably start in around the $30,000 range at a starting point from a software perspective and, and go from go from there. Um, but I think that's some, uh, that, that's one of the small aspects of it. That it the, the bigger aspect is actually what's the hardware you require. If you've already made a significant investment in scanners and scales and things like that, um, you know, we can reuse a lot of that, so that's actually savings there. But if you get into things like the, the mobile computers, uh, the wash down workstations and stuff like that, it, it's just you're, you're adding technology to, to, to your, your solution there. So you're literally adding the cost of computers uh, and data collection devices. And then the last piece is if you already have um, a network infrastructure, um, like Ethernet running in your plant, you're probably good to go. Um, we talked a bit about wireless today. Wireless is really um, affordable today. You're, you're looking at wireless access points that used to be thousands of dollars now in the three to four hundred dollar range. And uh, if you've got a like a like a twenty thousand square foot plant, um, you're really looking at like you know five access points. You know, at probably tops. You know, at three to four hundred dollars each, uh, you're looking at a really minimal in, uh, investment in wireless technology as well. So these solutions are not as expensive as you might think. And if you happen to be in Canada. Um, you, some of you may have heard of the Growing Forward program that's put on by the uh, by the Canadian government. Um, there are uh, there is co-funding available, actually up to 50% for processors um, to buy a, a traceability solution if you're using it for market growth and things like that. Um, and if you actually bring a supply chain to the table, so you bring in maybe a, an abattoir, a further processor, and maybe a retailer, um, if the three of you get together and work together, uh, or sometimes companies own all three. Um, you can get up to 75% uh, co-funding back from the government as well. So I, I encourage you to check out uh, the Growing Forward program on uh, Agriculture Canada's website for that as well. Outside of that, let me see if we have any more questions. Um, if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to wrap today by giving you the contact information of our presenters today. Um, so that Daphne at the Ontario Independent Meat Processor. Um, and myself and Gavin, um, feel free to use the email addresses there. Um, if you have any questions at all whatsoever, please feel free to uh, contact us. Um, outside of that, um, we have, I know we've gone a little bit over time today, but we have enjoyed uh, sharing this, uh, this last hour with you. And uh, again, if you do need any information, uh, Carlisle does offer free traceability assessments. Uh, call the 800 number there or email me, and uh, we can actually give you free consultation over the phone. Um, depending on where you're located, come out and actually do a site visit as well, and uh, just give you, you know, an idea of what the scope of the investment and the technology it would take to get you there um, to the level of traceability that you would like. So at that point, um, I'd like to wrap today's webinar and uh, thank my presenters today and thank you all for showing up today. So thank you very much. Thank you.